There we go. And, and we are off. Um, so, folks, thank you all very, very much um, for, for tuning in um, to this week's, this week's webinar. I'm delighted to welcome um, Kier Mooney, um, who's a senior physiotherapist with the HSC. Um, Kira, who is originally from Ballygar and Galway, she now resides in, in Athlone. Um, and she's got quite a lot of interest um, with everything going on. Guys, just make, sorry, guys, just make sure you're on mute, okay? Um, so we've got quite a lot of interest on, on the call today from everyone in, in, in New York, from Shannon Gales in Rockland, to everyone in Ireland. We've got from Derry, Dublin, Tipperary, Galway in the chat. And we have people from all four codes in Gaelic Games. Um, as well as few people of interest in mixed martial arts and, and, and rowing. So the 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 presentation today is in, injury prevention in Gaelic Games, but hopefully everybody will take away one or two things um, away from, from Kier's presentation. And she's did a fantastic piece of work. I've sent the questions on there yesterday um, and a, a fantastic presentation. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it over to Kier. I'm going to turn my, my microphone and, and video off and let you, let you on, Kier. Thanks, Mickey, uh, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, I want to say hello to everyone, and thank you all first and foremost. I know it is webinar crazy time, um, and there are webinars going on um, every evening about every sort of a thing. So I really appreciate you taking the time to tune into this one. Um, uh, as well as that, I hope you are all well, you and all your families. It's um, a better day in Ireland. Today is the first day that we had no reported deaths from COVID-19. So hopefully that's a sign of things to come, that things are getting better and we'll hopefully be back on our GEA pitches um, sooner rather than later. I know we're all dying to get back. Um, and finally, just thanks to Mickey for inviting me. <laughs> I know <laughs> uh, he's very, very good for inviting me. Uh, I tease him that he's struggling to find people if he's inviting me. Um, but Mickey uh, is a good friend, uh, I have to say, and I really appreciate the invite uh, to talk about something I am quite passionate about. Um, so for today, hopefully this just comes along. I think there's a little bit of a delay uh, in the presentation. Our aims are we're going to look at injuries in Gaelic Games, uh, and then we're going to look at the prevention. So are we doing enough or more so what can we do now um, to hopefully prevent the injuries that may happen if we return to a delayed season. Um, we're going to look a little bit more into detail about recovery um, and look at it as prehab more so than rehab. So again, how you can prevent the injuries and then look at injuries specifically related to the fact that we might have a later starting season. So to start with a little bit about myself, um, first and foremost, I am a Gaelic footballer. As Mickey said, I'm from a small town in Galway called Ballygar. And I was very, very privileged to grow up with nothing other than a Gaelic football club to do in our small village. Um, fortunately, we were a really, really, really successful club, uh, starting at under 14 Vela, which I know a lot of my New York friends will be really, really um, uh, aware and, well, I suppose, interested in. And then some people here may also have been to Vela and their great memories and going all the way up to adult level. So growing up, um, I was very, very privileged that we didn't really lose too much. Um, and we didn't realize, I suppose, how lucky we are. We won lots of everything. Um, I won't say who or where I am in that picture, but um, I know there's one or two people tuned in that might recognize themselves in it. Um, and I think Gaelic football, like a, like a lot of people here and definitely a lot of people in New York, has given me a family um, no matter where I've gone in the world. Um, that's definitely true to say with my affiliation with New York. Um, my link there is that my husband, Owen, was the Games Development Officer there. And we had a brilliant time in New York. Rockland was um, a wonderful experience for both of us. And they were absolutely fantastic to both of us. And we met lifelong friends and even family members there. Um, so we were really, really lucky. As well as that, I spent a J1 somewhere playing with the fantastic Boston Shamrocks. Um, uh, I then went uh, to college in London, so I played my football over there with Holloway Gale and uh, eased into retirement in a fantastic place called Ballyhays in Cavan and a fantastic club. 
And in each of these places, I've made friends for life. And I've been really, really lucky. And Gaelic football has been really, really good to me. Um, as I said, I went to college in East London, uh, studying physiotherapy, and I graduated in 2007. Uh, I took a six-month job in Cavan, and I ended up staying 10 years, uh, where I started to specialise in paediatrics in 2010. During this time, I was working in private practice as well um, in Cavan Town, and that was absolutely fantastic. It gave me um, great experience, especially in sports injuries. Um, and I was also working with teams around Cavan, uh, for instance, Cavan Gales, some of the Cavan inter-county teams and some of the ladies teams. As well as that, um, I suppose uh, I continue to work with my own club as the club physio. Um, and uh, I, re I really, really enjoy that. As I like to say, if I wasn't physio enough at games, I'd be at them anyway, so I may as well help out. Um, so my own club is St. Brendan's in Galway. Um, they're a dual hub. Uh, they're equally talented at both, if any of them are listening in. Um, but you mightn't have heard of them. Uh, but uh, that's my own background. So before we begin, um, and we're going to go into the stats on some Gaelic injuries. Um, it's a little bit, I'm a little bit of a grim reaper. And like I'm giving you stats on, oh man, you're like this time's likely to get injured in a match. You're this time's more likely to do your hamstring and all these kind of things. It's it's really, it's a little bit doom and gloom for the next couple of slides. So what I want everybody to take home before I say the next couple of slides is that the benefits of playing Gaelic sports and of playing any sport far outrisk the risk of it, um, far outweigh the risk of injury. Um, except if you're playing something stupid, obviously. <laughs> um, but the benefits, I suppose, if we think about it for our Gaelic games, aside from stuff like your fitness, looking at your bone health, building your strength, building your cardiovascular fitness, so you're improving your lungs and your heart, you're also going to improve like your digestion, you're going to improve your sleep. But there's things that you don't even notice. You're going to improve, let's say, social skills, especially among children. Um, they're going to have a greater awareness of rules and turn taking and making friends and maintaining relationships and developing relationships. Um, so before I say any of the stats and any of the facts, it's really, really important that we all know that the benefits of playing Gaelic sports hugely, hugely outweigh any, any risk of injury. So to look at sports injury, the definition is an injury that occurs during a sporting activity. It can be accidental, traumatic, or happen for a reason, and it can be any part of the body can be injured, but it is usually musculoskeletal. And when we say musculoskeletal, it's exactly that. It's the muscle or the skeletal system, so bone, normally. So injuries in Gaelic games, um, if we think of the common ones, sprains, strains, fractures, yes, it is the exact the same thing as a break. I had to argue with my dad with this over the weekend. Cuts, grazes, bruises, dislocations, cruciates, overuse of repetitive injuries, ruptures, avulsions, pulled hamstring, classic. Um, and we see oral injuries, so injuries of the mouth, of the jaw, concussion. And here are a few of my favourite slides. I'm going to leave them up there just for a minute or two to see if you can recognise any players. Um, they're cross codes. Uh, you can see the classic pulled hamstring from uh, the guy in the top left uh, who's holding his hamstring and you can see the temporary hurler in the middle right picture is literally pulling up mid-flight with his hamstring and I think you don't need, you don't need to be a qualified physiotherapist or anything like that to recognise that that's probably a hamstring going there. Um, my favourite picture out of all of them I have to say is probably uh, in the bottom row where the clear hurler is literally bending his hurl um, over the helmet of a limerick hurler. Uh, I mean, it, uh, it defies physics and gravity and everything else. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, but I don't know uh, what injuries resulted from it. Um, so if we talk a little bit about the stats and injuries in Gaelic games. So here's a few of the studies. There's not a huge amount of studies. Um, the studies that have been done tend to be done more so on males. Um, and tend to be done more so on uh, inter-county footballers. And when you think about it, that makes sense because they're going to be easier to measure because they'll normally have 
some sort of medically trained personnel at their trainings and at their matches that can assess and quantify an injury for the likes of this analysis. Um, so there's not a huge amount of stats um, on the club player, but there are some and we'll go through them. So we're starting with the adolescent. Um, I know there might be some parents here. Um, so the stats say that you are more likely to get injured in a match uh, rather than training. And this study looked at adolescent hurling and football, which is really, really good. Um, it looked at 292. Now, it did only look at male teenagers, and they were from 14 to 16 years. Um, and the good thing is it looked at them for over a year. It was done by Siobhan O'Connor and colleagues, and she's quite prominent in Gaelic Games research, and it was published in 2016. So they found that um, as well, Adolescents are more likely to get injured in the fourth quarter of the game. A quarter of these injuries were overuse and nearly half were reoccurring injuries. Um, but more so in football rather than hurling. You're more likely to get a lower limb injury. So by lower limbs, the two legs and of the two legs, it's more likely to be the knee and the ankle. And the most common injury in Gaelic footballers was hamstrings. And the most common injury for hurlers were their lower back. So that's just one, um, I suppose, especially if you're a coach, I find it really interesting. Um, I'll sometimes be in a sideline and a coach will be like, oh, you know, uh, Martin's hamstring was tweaking, but sure he's got you the match all right. It's really, really important that if this is an underage match, he's probably more likely to do it in the fourth quarter. So maybe take him off for the last quarter and give him a rest or something like that, if he's even playing in the first place. So if we look a little bit more, so the stats on club um, Gaelic footballers. So this is a little bit of an older study um, and it looked at 61 club um, footballers. The criteria to meet this was that you were over 18 years of age. You had played senior the previous season. And now um, one or two, you might not meet this criteria, but you had to go to at least one training session per week. Um, it found that, uh, again, you were more likely to get injured in a match than training. Um, interestingly, you were 10 times more likely in this study to get injured in a match rather than training. So comparing it to, we'll talk about it a little bit in the next study, but I suppose um, there wasn't as big a difference in inter-county players in terms of uh, getting injured in a match versus training. So you're thinking that the inter-county players are doing a higher level of training, which means they're more match ready and less likely to get injured than the club Gaelic footballers who are not as match ready and more likely to get injured. Again, like the adolescents, uh, most likely to get injured in the fourth quarter. Lower limb injuries more so than upper limb, again, makes sense. And the ankle was most common five times more likely to do your ankle in a match rather than training. Um, contusion or a bruise was more likely to be injured other than muscle ligament and fractures. Um, you are most likely to be injured tackling and sprinting. And the goalkeeper was the position that was most likely to get injured, which I thought was really interesting as well. So looking at, sorry, we'll go back. Uh, looking at then the elite or inter-county, this was a great study. This was a huge, huge study. This looked at 851 inter-county players over four seasons. So this is probably one of the best studies that the GEA had to go on. And you had to be an inter-county player. There was no, uh, obviously there was people who came on and off the panel and people who retired and so on and so forth. Um, so again, they were more likely to get injured in a match rather than training. Again, that makes sense, but as I said, Nothing compared to the difference, um, like the club players, which were 10 times more likely. I think you were maybe four times more likely uh, as an inter-county player. This one's a little bit different. Inter-county players are most likely to get injured in the third quarter. Again, I would say this is probably linked to the fact that they're highly trained. Um, half time comes, they cool down. Uh, blood flow to the muscles maybe cools down. This is only anecdotal, obviously. Um, and when they go out and try and restart and ramp up to that massive, massive high level, um, there's a difficulty getting up to it and they're more likely to get injured rather than um, the club player who 
might have done a warm up and be up here and consistently might go down to half time and go up. Whereas an inter-county player will do a warm up, be up, come down at half time and then have to get up again in terms of performance and stuff like that. Most likely is an inter-county player to get injured at 25 to 29 years. Now, the reason for this was that basically the, the highest number of players in this study were in that age bracket. So they had the highest but they did find that there was a positive relationship between age and injury. So no good news there for any older players. Uh, a midfielder was most likely to get injured in inter-county with the goalkeeper at least likely. And you were more likely to get injured in non-contact, um, more so than contact. So um, this is a little bit different as well to the club player, um, I suppose. But it still makes sense that you're sprinting, you're turning, you're cutting and your ankles and so on and so forth. Um, again, muscle is the most likely to be injured over ligament, tendon and fractures. Um, and the interesting thing about this one was that nearly three quarters were new injuries. So in the inter-county player, very, very little of them were reoccurring injuries. Um, so that says a lot about the level of probable rehab that they would have done beforehand, that they didn't then didn't go and re-injure or cause the same injury again. If we look at Komogi, for any Komogi players um, that are listening in, again, match more than training, um, contact more so than non-contact makes sense in Komogi, uh, lower limb more so than upper limb, hamstring and Achilles were the common ones, and again, this time muscle equals ligament, but more so than bone, tendon, etc., and the goalkeepers are most likely to get injured again. That study looked at 62 players, but over, over um, only one season. And again, that would correlate an awful lot to um, the higher um, instant rate of injury and hurling because of the contact. Um, in ladies Gaelic football, um, I suppose just to say that there isn't a huge amount of um, analysis or evidence in terms of ladies Gaelic football. Um, I know with Lidl on board, they are doing quite a lot of research, um, particularly looking at uh, hormones and hormone levels and their effect on injury rates, particularly looking at the menstrual cycle and where an in a player is in the menstrual cycle and how that might affect their flexibility and their adaptability and if it, if it is related to a higher risk of injury. And um, some of the evidence that they do, um, they do have though is that ladies Gaelic football players are less likely to get injured than male Gaelic football players. There's no difference in player position. Again, it's lower limb more so than upper limb, um, muscle more so than bone, more so than ever, everything else. And the knee is the most injured of the joints. Um, and we know that female um, Gaelic footballers are about six times more likely to do their cruciate um, over male Gaelic football players. So that's probably why the knee is the highest one there. Um, uh, you can compare the kind of ladies Gaelic um, when I was looking at the research you can maybe look at soccer um, because if we look at soccer both men's and women have very similar um, contact ladies Gaelic football will be non-contact whereas men's will be contact but in soccer both have similar levels of contact um, women have a lower in incidence of certain injuries so like a hamstring and a groin would have a much higher incidence of uh, cruciate and stuff like that so just to bear in mind, depending on who you're playing with or who you're who you're training with. So how do we prevent these injuries? Um, let's look at the easiest thing um, that you all probably have at home that can uh, prevent the injuries. So first and foremost, a gum shield. Um, so when gum shields were first introduced, they saw about a 40% reduction in dental claims in the GEA. So it's a super, super, a really, really basic one. And if I had a euro for the every time a player comes over to me with their gum shield in their stock, I'd be a rich woman by now. But um, it's purely like if at all, you know, if, if you're a player that doesn't find a gum shield comfortable, I would say invest in one. Go to a dentist, get it specifically measured and made for yourself so that it will feel comfortable and get used to it. Like, um. I remember when I was um, weaning mine in, I wore it around the house. I made sure I wore it to all trainings um, before I actually had to wear it in the match. And then wearing it in the match wasn't an alien. 
but it's it's like anything if you train without your gum shield it's really really hard to play with your gum shield because you're going to feel like you can't breathe you can't talk you know um i know male players maybe like to spit it's harder to spit and stuff like that so if anything just make sure you have a good a good gum shield for kids it's a little bit difficult especially that they're growing um, and chances are they're going to be lost but definitely if you're minor up invest in a good gum shield Helmet then, um, pretty basic one. They're mandatory in hurling and camogie, um, and I shouldn't see anyone without one. Um, even cooking around, kind of, you should be thinking about your helmet and stuff like that, and especially for uh, practice. And then our boots, we're going to talk a little bit about our boots and the type of boot and what um, the impact they have on preventing injury. So, um, sorry. Pressing the wrong button here. So the helmet, I suppose, very simply, don't mess with your helmet. Um, it is really, really important that you leave it the way it is. Um, I know it, some players feel it impedes on their vision. But um, it's an important thing to note that if you do sustain any sort of injury to the head and um, it's known that your helmet was altered, then, or it's modified or anything like that, then you're not covered under the GEA injury fund. So just to bear that in mind. Um, then if we look at football boots, this is a really, really interesting one. And I know, especially when I first started physio and there were clubs that um, basically were um, banning certain types like blades. Um, I know when the predators came in, everybody was mad for them. Um, Puma King are always a classic and stuff like that and the Adidas Copa is always always classic but I suppose looking at the different uh, cleat or cog orientation and in terms of um, in terms of the performance and injury and stuff like that so there's loads and loads of research um, particularly in soccer um, and a lot in American football about the cleat distribution and what it does and it, Kind of to sum it up, um, they, they found that uh, the kind of blades maybe give you better traction, so it might make you a bit faster and a bit sharper. But you're, it's really, really hard to rotate or to turn with the blades so that you're more likely to do a torsion injury, so to go over in your ankle or do the ligaments of your knee. They also don't know what the long term um, the long term implications of, of kind of blades. So to sum it up, I suppose, you are better um, you're better to probably have a combination. So if you look at the hybrid studs of the blades, um, having a combination of both. So um, blades have pretty much disappeared now. They're kind of out of fashion. Or what used to be blades, long, slim, and kind of rectangular, are now kind of like uh, triangular and much, much shorter. So they allow a little bit of rotation um, and they they kind of reduce the resistance on the outside of your boot. So many of the newer boots are actually going back to conical shaped cleats. So, um, but they'll offer a mix of like very, very short blades in that kind of triangular shape and a conical cleat, or they'll go back to like a really, really original um, design. The best thing to do though, is that especially I suppose um, depending on the surface you're playing. And if we're thinking about a delayed season, um, so potentially going back to playing football in October and hopefully going back play um, training a little bit earlier. So if we go back training during the summer, you're thinking hard ground and you're definitely thinking hard ground because it hasn't been used. Um, and for some of you, your clubs will have artificial grounds like 3G and 4G pitches or AstroTurf. So you're definitely looking at a shorter blade um, or a shorter even cleat, should I say, and the conical type of thing. Then you're looking at later on in the year. So as the year goes on, the ground will get softer. You obviously need a little bit more traction. You need a little bit more dig in. So you should have the longer kind of maybe rubber molded or steel studs. I know in some sports, the steel studs are banned. And for some sports, you have to have them. So... Just depending on your sport, depending on the surface, you're more more likely to be uh, training and playing on. I know some club players will have um, different boots for even their different pitches within their club. 
um, because some of you might be trading on a back pitch which is soft or playing on a newer crunty or artificial kind of pitch. Um, but it's definitely an investment to have two pairs of boots. Um, they've also done lots of research in terms of, let's say, whether it should go over the ankle or under the ankle, what sort of material you should have. And they've basically found that because everyone's feet are so very different, um, much like us buying runners, we know that some brands don't suit us, some brands do, and um, boots are the exact the same that it isn't kind of one size fits all and a lot of the time you have to go with what's comfortable in yourself and um, getting injured that little bit more especially lower limb injuries it will be um it will be a great idea to look back at if you change boots and if you think that is related so that's all i'll say about it it's a controversial topic um sorry now it is telling me my network isn't great i hope it's okay my um Lovely husband is doing a webinar at the same time, so hopefully we're all right. So we've talked about the injuries, we've talked about uh, protective equipment. Now we're going to talk a little bit about some things that you can do yourself to help prevent injuries. So um, we know that muscle injuries are the most common injury in Gaelic games. We know that among muscle injuries, it's most likely to be the hamstrings, quads and then the calves that are most likely to be injured. So what can you do um, to try and prevent them? So here are some factors that predispose a player to muscle strains. So an inadequate warm up, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. An insufficient range of motion, so basically not enough movement at a joint, which is directly linked to excessive tightness, so very, very tight muscles. Fatigue, overload or inadequate recovery. Muscle imbalances, so um, let's say, for example, your quads work with your hamstrings because your quads are in the front of your thigh and your hamstrings run on the back of your thigh. So if one is way stronger than the other or vice versa, then that's a muscle imbalance. So you're more likely to get injured in one of them. Previous injury. So if you've previously strained your hamstring, you're more likely to do it again. Um, faulty technique or biomechanics. So um, in particular, looking at boys doing strengthening exercises and stuff like that, um, are they leaving, leaving themselves open to injuring certain parts of their body? Spinal dysfunction. Growth spurts is an interesting one. And I will always, always, always tell my parents um, uh, to continue um, measuring height on the door frame is a classic one where people normally do it. This tends to kind of stop when they become too cool as a teenager to be doing things like that but if you have a youngster coming home complaining of pain frequently or complaining of kind of sore legs or tired legs or something like that it's a really good idea if you don't notice it like in the school trousers which is the classic one that mums notice it in get them up against the door and measure their height and see if they have grown a little bit bones grow faster than muscles so or than tissues so what happens is if a bone elongates and the muscle inserts into the bone but it's not elongating at the same rate you're going to have a muscle that's really really taut and then if he goes out and play if he or she goes out and plays um or loads that muscle you know maybe even goes to the gym um it's at more risk obviously of straining or um of avoiding and then uh, unfortunately, being a female is a factor. Uh, you are predisposed to more muscle strains. Um, females have less strength as a whole uh, than males. We're seen to be less coordinated. I don't know if that's true in a lot of cases. Uh, we have more quad dominance, so our hamstrings aren't as strong, let's say. We often have one leg much stronger and we rely on our ligaments more than our muscles for our stability. And as I said, we're four to six times more likely to get ACL injuries. So they are the kind of things that might predispose you to a muscle injury. And I suppose just looking at it, have a think to yourself if you're a player about how many of these can you actually tick? Like how many of these, you know, do you maybe like have a previous injury? Are you not very good at your recovery? Are you mad to play? Are you playing like hurling on football and you're out like six nights a week not doing your recovery? And you have a history of injury and stuff like that. So it's really, really, it's a really good idea to, I suppose, look at this even afterwards and kind of be like right maybe some of these things have something to do with why I'm getting injured. So I said we would look at the warm-up a little bit more and that was actually um, a good few questions came in about 
um, the warm up and what exercise could you do to target the whole body or what stretch should you do to target the whole body or how long would an adequate warm up be. So thankfully the GEA have done an awful lot of this research for me. So the GEA have done the, what's called the GEA 15 and this is based on a program by FIFA and the Santa Monica Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Research Foundation. So there's a huge amount of evidence behind it. It was piloted and it's proven to reduce injury occurrence and it's effective before use in both training and games. I do know of teams that always use this as part of their warm up and that is probably what I would be advising. There's a huge body of evidence. If you think of FIFA and you think of Santa Monica Orthopedic, that's a big American research um, foundation. So there's a huge amount of research and evidence behind this worldwide, not just in Ireland and not just in our tiny Gaelic games. It's multi-sport and stuff like this. And it, it has a massive, massive reduction. So um, basically, it has been shown that it will reduce by 45% the training injury rate and it reduced by 29% the match injury rate. So that's absolutely massive, absolutely massive. You can see I have a screenshot of it um, beside it. But if any of you want to look it up, and I would suggest you do, just Google the GEA 15 warm-up. Um, the GEA have done a great job on it. There's videos, there's teaching points, and all these kind of things. Um, and it is really, really important. I know Ulster GEA... Um, had a similar version prior to the GEA called the Activate Warm-Up. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, so the structure of the warm-up um, is it comprises of three different sections. The first section um, basically starts at running exercises at slow speed. Um, and the next section is looking at improving the biomechanics and limiting the risk of injury. It should take a max of seven minutes. You're looking at strengthening, which is focused on the core and the legs. You're looking at balance, jumping and hamstrings specifically as a muscle. And then section three is basically where you're going sports specific at moderate high speed. So you're building up the speed, you're building up kind of sports specific exercise and you're bringing in some turning. And that's what we mean by planting and cutting. So some turning and some sharp movements and stuff like that. Um, so prior to matches, only the running exercises. So part A and part F should be performed obviously you can do everything but prior to training you should do everything and it should only take 15 minutes now how you choose to do it is absolutely up to you i know some clubs basically lay out the cones and as lads come out they go through it themselves because they know it so well and um, other clubs and um, the coach will always do it and the coach will be there to look at technique and improve technique and so on and so forth and um, it really doesn't matter as long as you're there um, it does need to be done regularly, though. It's not something that you can just decide is going to be your secret weapon when we start back matches. Um, this needs to be practiced. Um, and, and if it's not done regularly, the benefits of it actually decline. So if you stop doing it, you're, you're not getting that injury prevention that you may have got beforehand. Um, but I suppose more importantly than doing it regularly, it needs to be done properly. So the teaching tips and the pointers and the videos are really, really good to look at your technique, especially for stuff like jumping. Uh, we're going to look a little bit more at like the hamstring exercises and stuff like that, looking at your technique and how you do, th do things. And I think one of the great things is we now all have time. We have more time than we ever had. We're not too busy anymore and we're not, well, most of us aren't too stressed anymore. Um, and we're, we're not out or on the road every evening, you know, chauffeuring kids to training or trying to get to training ourselves or commuting, I suppose, you know, a long distance to train or play matches and stuff like that. So we now have time. This only takes 15 minutes. So I think now would be a great time to actually just um, focus on it and try and get a really, really good technique of doing this and try and get into a rhythm of doing it and kind of know off the exercises off by heart when you can. So if we look a little bit more um, at the hamstring part and it's looking at Nordic hamstring curls, I'm always amazed um, in practice at the amount of Gaelic footballers and hurlers and hockey players and ladies Gaelic footballers that have never ever heard of a Nordic hamstring curl. So Nordic curls can reduce hamstring injury rates by 51%. We know that hamstrings are the most likely muscle to get injured. Therefore, if you can reduce your chances of injuring that hamstring by 51%, like it's, it's a 
it's an easy it's an easy sell I think and um, it should be a part of every single training session and as part of every single one it really really should and for lads that are doing stuff at home by themselves if you can at all try and include this it starts with um, very very simply three sets of six to eight reps so it's not that you're doing it for 20 minutes or anything like that starting really really slow concentrating on your technique Google how to do them and stuff like that. You can see Man City, Mika Richards does a really, really good one. Um, they're really, really, really hard. Like your hamstring will be cramping. You'll find them really, really hard, but they're absolutely super. And um, anecdotally, when I use this in private practice, I definitely saw a reduction in recurrent hamstring injuries com coming back to me. Definitely, definitely, because they had sufficiently strengthened it for the load that was coming. Um, another good one that you can think about um, doing at home, I suppose, thinking about um, the chances of injuries when you go up. We know that hamstrings are more likely to get injured. And the next big one, particularly in male GA players, is the groin. So a lot of you have heard of Gilmore's groin, adductor tendinopathy, hernias, and so on and so forth. Um, and definitely um, adductor plays a huge, huge role in Gaelic games because they're the muscle that we use for turning or cutting, as we said, and that's most likely where it's going to be injured. Um, so the Copenhagen's um, injuries, um, look at them a little bit here. So this is an adductor strengthening program. And again, this is really, really good evidence as well. This has reduced groin injuries by 41%. And you can see there's, a, there's an idea of where to start there, level one, level two, and level three. And then if I just bring it on, this just doesn't show really, really well. It, it comes up a little bit blurry. Um, but it basically looked at looking at semi-professional and professional uh, soccer players. And um, as I said, they reduced groin injuries by 41%. It's really, really easy. Um, they've done a super groin course in the past. Um, and it was run by some physios working with the British Olympic team. And they use these as like their bread and butter adductor kind of strengthen. Um, so it's a, another really, really simple one that you can incorporate into your program. If you look at week one, they want you to do three to five reps twice a week on each side. Like it's not a huge time constraint um, and it's relatively easy done. And other than having a friend, you don't need any uh, fancy gym equipment or anything like that. Just to touch on as well, obviously, for prevention of injuries, uh, you need to be adequately um hydrated and obviously we need to have uh, adequate fuel and um, I suppose just I always tell the players to look at it like uh, you're a car and nutrition is your diesel or your petrol and hydration is your oil and you can't go without either and um, you have to you have to have both and they have to go hand in hand so place as much emphasis on your diet and your as your hydration and vice versa um, not my field of expertise, so I'm not going to go into it um, anymore. Maybe if we can get a dietitian on to talk to you. So if we speak a little bit about recovery then. Um, recovery, I suppose, one of the biggest uh, things is that, you know, you hear of, oh, the manager should have put on a pool session the day after that match. It was a really tough game. Or, you know, we had chocolate milk after training. We had loads of Jaffa cakes at half time. Um, or um, alternatively here, we had a really hard training session Friday night. We got the SA20, absolutely ran out of us, and now we have a championship game on Sunday. So um, I suppose it's just looking at adequate recovery and whose responsibility it is. Um, optimally, it really, it is your responsibility. It's their decision uh, how they choose to train you, and you're probably not going to impact that too well. But one thing you can control is your recovery. And I really, really, really would um, advise that everybody. It's super, super important. And I think we're getting better. Like, I think we're getting better at minding ourselves that little bit more and trying to nip injuries in the bud and trying to look after ourselves. Like, you know, you'll see the boys with the shakers in their uh, in their gear bags. Um, you'll see them with the protein bars and um, you know, with the foam roller and stuff like that. So trying to look after themselves that little bit more. And I think it has a huge impact in your performance and your recovery. Um, if we look here, you can see a little bit, um, there was a study done in 2018 about recovery strategies for impact-induced muscle damage. 
And that's basically what's happening every time we are Gaelic training. We are um, having some muscle damage because we're trying to load the muscle, we're trying to build the muscle, we're trying to strengthen the muscle. So ways that you can um, that you can recover from it. Um, and it just basically looked at cold water immersion, antioxidants like um, cherry and uh, blueberries were really, really good, and then preventative strategies, so not putting yourself in that um, situation again. Um, I suppose one of the most important and uh, interesting things from our cycle that we looked at back here was that there's absolutely loads and loads and loads of evidence to show that players who get less than eight hours sleep per night are way more likely to get injured. They're nearly twice as likely to be injured than players who get more than eight hours. So I think sleep and sleep hygiene, as we call it, so having a really good sleep routine or a bedtime routine and so on and so forth is really, really important. And now is a really good time to get into that. Um, we all know the advice around screen time, but simple advice like, having a wind down period, making sure your bedroom is restful, it's quiet, making sure that you know you've no big harsh bright lights for reading, that it's a little bit calmer, making sure that maybe you have the blackout blinds. These are all really, really good kind of strategies to employ now. Um, and they're ones to keep in mind, I suppose, when we go back to the hustle and bustle. And I know like some of my club players, they might come down for a train in midweek, get in a car, drive back to Dublin and, you know, kind of be expected to go to sleep or whatever. And normally what happens is because you've been away from your phone all evening, because you've been driving straight and training, driving back, you go on Instagram to catch up with what everybody else is doing. You go on Facebook and you've lost an hour of your life and all of a sudden you have to be up in six hours for work and it goes on and so on and so forth. So just remember that in terms of your recovery, if there's one thing you can do, try and make your sleep really, really, really good quality and more than eight hours. Um, so this is a really good info, um, idea as well. You can Google it. It's called the 100 point strategy for recovery. And basically what this guy did this study and basically found that if you could give your, yourself 100 points within 24 hours of training or a match, that you're less likely to get injured, you're going to improve your performance and you're going to build muscle strength much, much better, which is exactly what we all want to do. So stuff like getting eight to 10 hours high quality sleep was 40 points. Um, hit your daily nutritional and hydrational targets, 40 points. Uh, a 20 minute swim, and that can be in the sea or in a pool, uh, 30 points. A 30 minute massage, 30 points. 15 minute in an Epsom salt bath. I thought that was a handy enough one for 20 points, really. 30 minutes active recovery session, like a foam roll, mobility and light bike and stretch. And I know people um, have asked, am I better doing foam rolling? Am I better doing stretching? It's really hard to say, um, depending on the actual muscle. Like, um, there's really very, very little point in foam rolling some muscles, whereas the likes of the hamstrings and the quads and stuff like that react very, very well. Um, but it also depends on, um, you know, it might be that you're super, super tight in your left hamstring. So you might be better stretching that left hamstring and foam rolling everything else, if that makes sense. So there's some more ideas for strategies to earn your 100 recovery points within 24 hours. Um, and you can see they're kind of just um, summed up here. And if you can, like, like self-massage or a slither or foam roller, that's 10 points. It adds up, you know, if you're good, it adds up fairly easy and stuff like that. But I definitely thought like uh, getting into water, getting into an Epsom salt bath and having your eight hour sleep is an easy way to control your recovery and can make for way, way better kind of um, performance and uh, injury reduction and stuff like that. So then burnout, this was a question that came in. So I suppose how to control um, how to keep young people active without them overloading and then how to reduce the risk of especially adolescent players in terms of burnout. Thankfully this season we don't have any concerns for burnout at all at all um, and I do think um, we're getting a little bit better and we're getting a little bit more aware of it um, but as I, you know, as I previously said I am a paediatric physiotherapist and my, definitely my special interest is the adolescent athlete 
because of all the changes that happened to both males and females during that time and their risk of injury. And burnout is a huge one, um, especially um, for people kind of in that like 15, 16 that can be playing a couple of age brackets and can be playing club and county, might be playing schools, might be playing more than one sport and stuff like that. Interestingly, it's not as much of an issue um, for our New York or American kids. And that's really because they've been brought up in cross code. So it is part of, P is a mandatory part of their curriculum and um, their fundamental movement skills or their physical literacy. So their ability to jump, throw, catch, run, kick, and so on and so forth is probably a, um, better at a younger age than let's say the Irish counterpart. Because of that as well, and I suppose because of the geography as well, um, like I know, for instance, in Rockland, you have softball, you have soccer, you have basketball, you have swimming, you had Gaelic, obviously. Um, there was lo absolutely loads of sports within a really, really, really small area. And you don't have that availability in the majority of Ireland, apart from kind of um, inner city and suburbia. Um, so those kids are using more muscles in more ways. Therefore, they're less likely to get injured and they're less likely to, I suppose, feel the chronic stress and strain that that results in burnout. So if we look at a definition of burnout, it occurs as a result of chronic stress that causes an athlete to cease involvement in a previously enjoyable activity. So basically, they decide I'm done with Gaelic, not doing it anymore. Um, I, I have to say, I've had very few athletes um, ask me, do you think I'm burnt out? But I have a lot of mums and dads come to me saying he'll be burnt out. He is burnt out. He shouldn't play that. He shouldn't play that. Or they shouldn't go here. They shouldn't do that. And so on and so forth. And I always go back to the World Health Organization guidelines. So sorry, you might be able to see that so well. So for five to 17 year olds, they should get 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity daily, seven days a week. And by moderate to vigorous, you should be out of breath. And vigorous, you should be very out of breath and sweating. You shouldn't be able to maintain conversation. You shouldn't be able to have the dance or the chat. And you 100% should not have your phone in your hand unless you're just listening to music. So often when I throw that stat out to a parent, they feel much better because they're like, well, no, definitely they're not getting that much. Now, you should include school activity. I know we don't at the moment, but if they are doing PE or they have a match at school, include that. But an awful lot of our five to 17 year olds are not getting that much vigorous activity every single day. So really just look back at the guidelines and look back at what age and the person you are concerned about. Let's say for an 18 to 64 year old, so an adult, we should be getting 150 minutes of vigorous activity weekly. And it doesn't matter how you break that up. Um, obviously, you know, if you think they're at risk of burnout, put emphasis on skill development more so than competition and, win and winning. And it should be at, a young, at, a young, at the younger ages as well. Um, there are some studies that look at early sports specialization. So um, we know that athletes who play multi-sports up until about the age of 12 are more successful and um, so there are there are studies that if you only play Gaelic football from a very young age and nothing else you're more likely to get injured and you're more at risk of burnout and um, if if you have um you know an adolescent or younger coming home complaining I suppose monitor their activity or pain and um, look at maybe potentially is it because of a growth spurt so you're measuring that as I said you're looking at height against the door frame um, and then look at um, limiting sport specific re repetitive movements if they are in a growth spurt so it might be that you might just um, pull back and train in a little bit if they are complaining of pain send them to training for the social aspect let them do the warm-up so on and so forth but it mightn't be that they take part in the full training um, and I suppose look at Try and um, remove yourself from the situation. Um, and if you have a child that is complaining, 
um, are they playing the sport because you want them to play or because they want them to play? And I know, especially in New York, the GEA has a huge cultural significance, but a lot of the kids playing GEA weren't born in Ireland and didn't grow up um, in rural Ireland with only GEA. They have lots of options and stuff like that. So I suppose to look at other reasons why a child might be um, complaining of burnout or might be complaining of not involving in that or not enjoying an activity and stuff. So we're nearly there. This is the last slide. Um, so um, one of the common questions was what can players, coaches, managers, what can everybody do during this time to prevent the risk of injury when we get back to playing Gaelic games? So I suppose at the moment we're looking at potentially going back training at some stage during the phases, maybe summer-ish time here in Ireland, um, with a view to returning to games maybe in October, whatever they may look, may look like, like behind closed doors or not. We know that decreased our training and activity increases our risk of injury, and that's exactly what's happening now with COVID-19. We're not able to train the way we used to. So we're not able to train our bodies to play football or to play hurling or camogie or, or handball. Um, therefore, it's really, really, really um, difficult for us to replicate what's going to be needed in a match situation. So what can you do at home? So I definitely think starting to familiar, familiarise yourself with the GEA 15 warm up and looking at your technique at doing it. Looking at your equipment, like your boots, making sure you have a good gum shield, making sure your helmet is in good work and order. And then looking at the adductor strengthening program, because we know when we go, we know if the GEA season resumes this year, we know that it's going to be like bang, 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 bang in terms of matches. And let's face it, we all can't wait. But we do know for both our male and female athletes and our adolescents that they are more likely to get injured in a match. So really what I suppose I would be worried that somebody, you know, we're potentially going to have missed um, Gaelic sports for so much of this year. We're going to go back, be so excited to go back, potentially get injured in the first match and then miss a whole championship because it's only been three weeks long. So um, I suppose if you can get yourself in as good an order as you possibly can. So we know things like, uh, your cardiovascular fitness. I know some clubs that are doing fast as 1K, so other clubs doing fast as 3K, and um, other clubs doing some strength and conditioning and stuff like that. I would tell every player, have the hurl and slither out or have the Gaelic football out, be banging it off the wall, be hand passing it off the wall, whatever you can do to try and keep your handling skills up as much as possible. And just keep an active as much as you possibly can. Hopefully we'll go back to training in small groups of four that we can kick a ball to each other. At least we can practice stuff like fielding or kicking off the ground and try and increase those skills. But it's going to be a long time before we can actually replicate matches, be it like playing five and five in terms of a warm up or even, you know, 15 v 15 when you have everyone down to training and playing a full game. It's going to be a long time before we can do that. So try and do as much as you can to try and prevent your risk of injury when you get back. Uh, finally then, just to say um, thank you all very, very much for tuning in. Um, as I said at the start, I can't wait um, for Gaelic Games to start again. And the most important thing, um, more so than the risk of getting injury or your chance of getting injury and stuff like that, is that we uh, enjoy it, and especially for our kids, that our focus on, is on them enjoying it and not feeling like they have to uh, be involved or they have to play. And that's it. Perfect. Perfect, Kira. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just just going through it there quickly, Kira. Just um, like from my point of view, just the, the whole, the stats are fantastic in that there. So, so thank you for going through each of the questions, breaking the themes. You've went above and beyond anybody we've had on um, over the last uh, two months now. So let's thank thank you very very much. Um, I can't I can't really say any more. Um, just on just so we, we leave in a, a really strong point here. Um, what would you be advising GA coaches now um, to do to make the most of the time um, for the season returning um, during isolation? Like what what would you uh, research wise and, and looking over stuff? 
Uh, yeah, and so as I said, definitely go back and um, get really familiar with GA15 in terms of a warm up. Um, I know that was one of the questions was asked was how long did I feel was an adequate warm up before matches? I definitely think you can do a really, really good warm up in 20 minutes if you're organised and people are on time and stuff like that. And it, you know, it doesn't need to take any longer. Um, I think if you go back, uh, familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with GA15, the Adductor Strengthening Program, keeping in touch with your players, I suppose, is really, really important as well. Checking in with people, um, more so from the team bonding and the mental health point of view. This is a really strange time for everybody. Um, it's a really, really strange time for all of us. And everybody's affected a little bit differently. And we know that people's families can be really, really affected by this. So I suppose just keep it in touch and um, being a source for people to um, go to, uh, being a person that they openly communicate and is open with their players is really, really important too. And trying to be as organized as possible for a potential return to training and what it might look like. Perfect. Um, folks, this, this, um, this presentation will be available um, on the New York GA uh, Games Development YouTube channel in a few days. Um, so you can you can rewatch it there if you want. Um, and just lastly, a massive, massive thank you to Kira. As I say, I can't, can't say it enough. She has literally went above and beyond. Usually I have to make the presentation or add a few slides together. I've done nothing today except except be able to watch. So um, Kira, thank you so, so much. This has been, been a really, really worthwhile and informative session. And hopefully, um, as I say, Everybody listening got something or one or two things to take away from it. Um, I know I definitely did. So, um, Kira, thank you very, very much. No worries. And just to say, if there was anything I didn't cover or anything that people um, want me to clarify, please pop it in the chat afterwards. Um, feel free uh, to get my contact details off Mickey if you want any references or any of the links to anything I may have talked about. Um, absolutely get in contact and you can send them on, no problem. I just got a text there from Stephanie Mahars from uh, New York, Elif Gardens Care. So she says thanks, thanks a million again. She, she, she can't. She thought it was easier to text me to say it. So, so again, so thank you for coming in. Um, <laughs> no worries. Thank you for that. And hello to everyone in New York. We miss you. We can't wait to visit again. I think that's. I think that's.